Well, I was talking about a presentation with a couple of items that a lot of people don't know an awful lot about big data and IoT. The second presentation already has beaten me to it, so that's really, really good and fascinating. Um, quickly about me, as Chris says, I'm a visiting professor at the university here. I'm also the chairman um, of the healthcare architects practice, which is interesting. So we design hospitals, wards, primary care facilities, care homes, but importantly, one of the guys is the national building information modelling um, chair for health. And all ones on the Lord Carter panel, which is looking at how we can improve NH NHS estates optimization, bearing in mind that the NHS estate um, has not like £10 billion worth that's underutilised, which only represents about 2% of the size of the estate, so it's quite significant. I'm a director of a company um, with some old colleagues, which is looking at um, mobilising clinical data from multiple systems and re-spinning the data to give intelligent information about predominantly primary healthcare capacity planning, population management, service alignment. And before then, I spent 25 years with a company that was a startup that now looks after over 50% of all the clinical records in the UK. So with that, we had about 40 million um, clinical patient records birth to grave that we're then able to do a variety of, of interesting things with. So talking about dementia, I think dementia is an interesting thing. There's a load of, of healthcare conditions that's interesting, but worldwide about one... Uh, a new patient is diagnosed with dementia every three seconds. It's important because in terms of the size here, we've got about 50 million people diagnosed with it last year, which is predicted by 2030 to be 75 million. So almost every 20 years, we're almost doubling the number of instances of, of patients suffering for dementia. Um, it affects all continents and all countries. And when you look at the size of the challenge at the moment, already the money spent on dementia and the cost of society is about 800 and 18 billion US dollars, uh, forecast to grow by 2018, so just a couple of years to a trillion, that's then forecast to increase to 2 trillion by 2030. Already if it was a country, it would be the 18th largest economy in the world, and the amount of time and cost that it takes worldwide is bigger than companies such as Apple, Google, Microsoft, etc. So it's something that is, is quite important that impacts on all of us. From a UK perspective, there's about a million people that have been diagnosed with dementia. About 60% of people have not been diagnosed, which isn't surprising because who wants a diagnosis of dementia? Um, so it's quite a big thing about engaging with people. Um, and one of the things we need to consider is, you know, by the time we die, one in six of each of us here are likely to be dying with suffering with dementia. And if you look around the room, one in, one in six people is, is quite a significant number. And um, there's the chance that we will know someone, a friend or a family member, that will be suffering from this condition. If you're a woman um, in the UK, there's a one in three chance that over 65 that you'll suffer from dementia. My wife tells me it's putting up with husbands, but you know, <laughs> we will make light of a, of, a, of a condition like this. So dementia, so, so what is it? So, so very quickly, it's a progressive disease, progressive illness. It starts off with um, mild memory loss, so you forget cars, you forget keys, you forget faces, names, peoples, um, places, sometimes to the point where you can get a bit irritable and depressed as a result of some of those symptoms. I think those symptoms have happened to a number of us. It then progresses relatively quickly to middle stage, which is where um, remembering names and people becomes such an issue that you actually forget to switch off the cooker, you forget to eat, you forget to go to the toilet, so you actually need to start to have quite a bit of care to make sure that you can maintain some form of normal, standard, healthy living. And the later stage is where you're actually unable to recognise most anything. Um, recent people, uh, recent memories, older memories, uh, people that are closest to them, you become weak, unsteady, difficulty eating, incontinence is quite common with that, and inability to, 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 to speak. Um, and this is, I've, I've seen two figures on this. One of these says if you've been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, which is one of the big indicators, um, you have a lifespan of eight to ten years after the symptoms begin. But I've seen other research that kind of says that actually a good number of us have already got some of those early symptoms already. So there's, there's different views in terms of that. So, I, 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 and financially already, and this is a paper that was just in 2013, so it's a few years old, but it already said that just for the UK it costs 19 billion a year and expected to increase to 50 billion over the next 30 years. So it's something that personally affects all of us and financially affects all of us and all of our businesses and our, and our institutions. So how does that relate to big data IT and, and the built environment? 
Um, big data, there's no point talking about big data because I guess most people know that there's a plethora of data that you can start to do some clever things with. And the Internet of Things is coming together quite nicely because already you can start with lots of devices giving them IP addresses. So light bulbs, you can switch them on, you can switch them off. You know, if they're on, you know, if they're off, you can change the colour. So if you've got mental health patients or patients in certain conditions, you can change the mood lighting that can have an impact. Um, you've got things like cookers that you can switch on or off or have different sensors and alerts. But what it means is that we've now got, we're in a society in a world where there's a plethora of enormous data that we can start to do some exciting things with. Um, and already, and this is slightly old technology, but if you go into Leeds Centre, there's the Trinity Centre, big shopping centre. Mm -hmm. um, if you walk in there with your phone, the chances are the sensors there will pick up your MAC address on your phone. It'll then check that against a number of other data sets, the chance that knows your age, sex, your spending capacity, whether you have a mobile phone, what sort of contracts that you have. It tracks your movement from different stores. So if the Apple store closes down, for example, they'll be able to say, well, actually, Apple Crumble and Pitch is near there. And the sorts of people that go to there are actually likely to go to this place. So they use that to resell information. If you go to one of the food retailers, if you go online and look at shoes, but you don't buy or you go in the shopping basket and you then walk in the store, they automatically know who you are, what shoe size you are, what sort of style of shoe that you're looking at. So there's all this stuff already that's, um, that, that's available, and it's increasing. So what can we do with all this stuff? Well, this is an example of a number of sensors in a care home that just tracks the movement of a, of a person throughout the care home. And what you see is, you know, circles, lots of dots and whatever. But what's interesting is it shows the um, patterns of behaviour and movement for a person over a period of time. And on its own, that's not particularly interesting or exciting, but then actually if you can start looking at um, actually what's normal for that person so that when they deviate from that you can introduce a number of triggers to actually say well something's up you know is it that they've got an infection and they need treating or is it this indicative of a trip or a fall or um, something else where it need to care or a care plan or someone to do something proactively with the person before they fall over hurt themselves and end up as an emergency admission to hospital. We've also got something in uh, our old company we did about five years ago, so we worked with a university, so we've got lots of clinical data, and we produced um, some predictive modelling tools. This is one on diabetes. Um, so what it does is it, pr it predicts to a percentage point a person's chance of becoming diabetic 10 years ahead. So the good thing is now that clinicians can sit down with patients, and this example that I've made up says, well, actually, this patient at the moment, according to their health and lifestyle, um, has a 54% chance of becoming diabetic. So what it means that proactively, a clinician can say to a patient, well, actually, by changing your lifestyle, because someone of your ethnicity and your age and sex should be on about 8%. So that kind of indicates that actually, if you change your lifestyle or your health, or you give up smoking and you reduce your weight, you can actually have a significant impact on the chance and the risk and the probability that you're going to suffer from a condition. As a lot of these tools that are coming out at the moment, it does need more academic research to underpin it, but it can also be applied to multiple other conditions. Um, here's an example of actually, this is the first one we did in 2008. So around the world, um, if you go to a clinician with cardiovascular disease, they run something called the Frangelin Risk Score. And uh, what we found is that it doesn't actually work because most of the research was in the US. It doesn't really work for a UK population that surprisingly was slightly more ethically diverse. So the algorithm was predicted in 2008 to save 200,000 lives over the next 10 years. So instantly one little algorithm saves 20,000 lives a year. This has been adopted nationally, it's already on QRIS2. So each of these little algorithms can have a very, very significant positive health and social care impact by anal analysing some of the data that's available that wouldn't otherwise be available um, historically. And more recently, in the old company, we created a, a website for patients that gets um, about 12 to 14 million hits a month. And we're thinking, well, actually, how can we re-spin some of the information that we've got for a, a sort of city-wide health and social care planning perspective? So if you go online to patient.co.uk, you can do things like this. So what it does, it gives you top trending topics so that when you go online and type anything to a healthcare, all that data appears. So we found in terms of outbreaks of flu, we found a direct correlation between what people were seeing clinicians with and what people were Googling. So the chance are before they see a clinician, they'll Google it first. So what we did is re that data of actually what's most common, 
So recently it's allergic conjunctivitis, which might have something to do with the weather or hay fever or whichever. But it's interesting because from a, an environmental health and social care perspective, you can start planning resources more strategically and you can start um, planning resources more tactically to respond to different some different conditions and potentially outbreaks. Um, bringing all of that back to, to sort of a built environment, this is um, something done by um, Stirling University, and it's a picture that they've got of just, um, so, you know, looking at dementia, of just the entrance to a hospital ward. So this is just one <coughs> very, very small part of, of a building, and if you look at the, the importance of this, so if you're suffering from dementia and you've got memory loss, you might have visual impairment, you've got a high contrast, so you can clearly see where the entrance to the facility is, um, you've got blinds at the top which could have strong lighting to reduce the glare from coming outside to a, a, a less lit in, uh, an environment. We've got a wall that hasn't got strong contrasting colours because that can be confusing. Works of art to an extent can be, can, can be um, soothing if they're clearly labelled and it's not abstract art. You've got clear signage on the right hand side that's not encumbered with loads of posters and health promotion stuff that just creates lots of noise and interference. You've got a colour contrast here of the entrance way that navigates you straight to the entrance of the hospital without a strong, without any patterns, which again is confusing. We found that some people, um, we had a supermarket that's nearby that had black mats outside and people walking up to the mats and walking around because they saw a hole. Um, so there's certain particular colours and styles and contrasts that are important in designing and building environments. We've got self-opening doors because revolving doors, as you can imagine, can cause quite a, quite a complexity. You've got a lobby area that's uh, draft-proof so you can walk up to it and you're not under pressure because of the weather or because of drafts or because of people rushing so you can take your time to enter the facility. As you go through there's a toilet immediately on the left hand side and if you go to the toilet you've got two taps, hot and cold, because if you've got a single one that a lot of the clinicians use, people, it's not, it's not, um, it's not friendly and people aren't really sure how to do with it. So there's a whole raft, I could go on and on and on about design tools about products and services that need to be built um, and, and actually implemented and designed and delivered to make sure that we design an environment that's friendly for all of us as, as we get older. And, the, and uh, two, two final slides is, well, how can we um, look at some of that and, and look at some of the big data and bring all that together? Well, already in the business we've been looking at building information modelling and mapping the built environment as it is now and how it's being designed to. So you can actually navigate it through and look at the impact of introducing different um, building materials and different designs um, in terms of this aesthetically but also in terms of the cost saving efficiency. Uh, we've been having a look um, with Microsoft at um, virtual reality so that designers can actually experience the built environment as it's being designed from different people's perspectives. So for example if there's visual impairment. Um, and we've got here, this is something that we're doing already, so what we're starting to do is look at different devices to, this is a hospital trust, to look at colour coding of different services, to start mapping the tracking of different patients for different services, to actually say, well, do we need to redesign this or do we need to decant by their particular bottlenecks to help inform the, the design of um, our, our healthcare state. And finally, this is something I saw uh, Booper did, which was quite interesting, is, is looking at um, more of a city-wide macro perspective. So this is this idea of dementia-friendly cities. So already, if you go into Leeds, there's 50 cafes that are dementia-friendly. So it encourages people with dementia to go out to um, into the community and not be afraid and feel intimidated about going into local businesses in Fairham in Hampshire. They did a similar project where they engaged all the local shops and they looked at the local signage to make sure it's more friendly for us as we get older. So you've got everything from the workplace, from training and education to make sure that people are more empathetic and, and understanding and to make sure that the environment is um, more risk averse and actually deal, especially public sector buildings with lots of different people coming into it to make sure that they're appropriately designed from um, care homes and um, people's homes to make sure we support independent le living by introducing devices and technology to make sure that people, that we can remain in a safer environment and perhaps with triggers and alerts that can highlight the fact that different people need help at different stages. So there's a whole load of things that start to come together when you look at it from a, a cultural perspective to help create a, create a sustainable environment. But the big thing on, the, on a personal base is this is something that's going to affect all of us and certainly I for one. 
would like to um, live longer, healthier, more independently in an environment that's more encouraging and supportive. So, uh, thank you for listening.